This lesson is on developing a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset towards intelligence, or what does it really mean to be smart? And here are a bunch of smart people we can look at. What do all these people have in common? What does it mean to be smart? And so we're going to get out our guided notes, and the objective for today is that I will be able to define growth mindset and diligent practice and begin thinking about how I can use this information to improve. So think about in your own life. Have you ever heard any of the following things or thought of these things in your head? Has someone ever said to you that you're just not very good at math? Or have you ever thought it about yourself? I'm just not very good at math. Have you ever looked at somebody else and said, oh, well, that person was just born being good at math? Or have you ever thought math is hard? So have any of you ever had those math struggles? Think about it for a second. And what you have to understand is that your brain is like a muscle and that school and what you do there and how you, how you go about it can help you turn your muscles from looking like this into like that. And so a growth mindset is this understanding that even one's most basic abilities can Im be improved. That the brain is like a muscle and that working it out will help lead to the results that you need. And that we can all improve in what we do. So what does growth mindset mean? It's the belief that one's most basic abilities can be developed through dedication and hard work. Okay, so now that we know what growth mindset is, let's go back through that strug those struggles. So if someone has ever said to you that you're not good at math, well, maybe you aren't very good at math now, but over time, you can improve. If you thought about yourself, I'm not very good at math. Well, if you believe that you can get better and you work at it, just like a bodybuilder lifting weights, you can get better. He or she is just born good at math. Well, just like muscles, some people may be born more muscular, but everybody can get big and strong if they work hard. And finally, math is hard. Well, yeah, lots of things are hard. But if you have a growth mindset and you work at it, then you can succeed and do it. So again, I showed you this picture of what we have a pretty good idea of what it looks like to get muscular, to get big and strong muscularly. What, is it like to, what does it look like to get s smarter? What does it actually look like? Well, it's about these things called dendrites. And dendrites, as we work out our brains, we don't grow muscles, we go dendrites. And here are some actual pictures of dendrites. It starts on the left with just a neuron or the, a brain cell. And you can see that brain cell growing these dendrites growing them out as they make connections with other cells and they get first they get longer and then more and more of them come until over on the right we see it looks almost like a tree with lots of branches coming from this one cell as it's re made more and more connections and as you grow dendrites that's what learning is all about and so what is a dendrite a dendrite is an extension or branch of the neural cells in our brains so a common lie is that our intelligence is fixed we were born as smart as we're ever going to be and again, that's a lie. And the problem with that lie is that it can lead to a common mistake that students make. Many students don't work hard because they think they're not smart. And again, if you're not smart and you can never get smart, then what's the point of working hard? Why should I try if I know I'm going to fail because I'm just dumb? This was told to us by Carol DeWick. She's the person who came up with this whole idea of growth mindset. But we know this isn't true. As I said, this is a lie. And so you need to understand that you are in charge of your mind and its growth. That you can be as smart as you want to be. And so I know so far it sounded like an infomercial, everything's great, you just have to believe. And it's not just what you have to believe, you have to work hard, but let me give you an example of someone who had a growth mindset and what they were able to accomplish. So in, in 2004, a gentleman named Joshua Fower, he was a writer and he wanted to improve his poor memory. There's a picture of him. He had a very poor memory, and so he, but he had a growth mindset. He believed he could grow, and so every day he started practicing with his memory and working out his memory and building those dendrites. And two years later, in 2006, he won the USA Memory Championship, setting a new world record. And to give you an idea of just how, what an accomplishment this was, well, how they do the world record or how they do these competitions is they get a standard deck of 52 playing cards and they shuffle it up randomly. 
and they give it to the person. And the person's job is to memorize the order of it. So you go through these cards and you say, okay, well, for the first card is the king of hearts, the next card is the two of diamonds, the next card is the six of spades, and so forth, da da da. And you have to go through all 52 cards and get all 52 of them right. In this competition, Joshua Fower memorized the entire order of a deck of cards in 100 seconds. That's under two minutes. That's what a growth mindset can accomplish with hard work. Okay, so let's take a quick quiz. How can you develop a growth mindset and get smarter? Is it A, by asking lots of questions, especially when you don't understand or you're stuck? Is it B, by trying really, really hard in every class, every day, and doing your homework every night? Is it C, by figuring out what you need to learn or what's holding you back and then learning it? Or is it D, all of the above? And I'm sure all of you know that whenever you have the all of the above, teachers like to give that one. It's a cheap way of being able to answer all, all the things we say. So the answer is all of the above. Now again, when we talk about growth mindset, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient for success. That is, without the belief that you can improve and grow, it's almost impossible to succeed. If you think you're going to fail, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will fail. However, success takes more than simply believing that you can succeed. It's not that, like tomorrow I can just say, okay, I believe I'm going to be good in math, and then suddenly I'm starting to get A's. It takes one other thing. And what else does it take? It takes diligent practice. And what exactly is diligent practice? Well, diligent practicing is practicing with great care and perseverance running into a wall and trying again and trying again and trying again. Great perseverance. Just keep trying and doing it with great care. Okay. And diligent practice is hard work. Remember Joshua Fower, this guy, the guy who won the world championship in memory? Well, he said this about diligent practice. When you want to get good at something, how you spend your time practicing is far more important than the amount of time you spend. What that means for you all is that when it's time to do your math homework, don't have your phone with you so you can check your text in case you get an important text and have a window open so you can see your email and you have the TV on in the background and you're having a conversation with your sister as she's coming in and out of the room. All those things are distractions and it keeps you from diligent practice. What you do if you want to practice your math, doing your math homework diligently, you turn off the TV, put your phone in airplane mode, have no distractions, get a, a desk with a good light, a blank piece of paper, tell your parents and your siblings that you're working and you need quiet, and get to work. That's what diligent practice is. Okay. Who knows who these guys are? Hopefully you've seen these guys somewhere. These are, of course, the Beatles. And we think of the Beatles, we think of them looking like this. This is when they ruled the world, were the most popular group in the world. Uh, we don't think of them like this, when they were your age. Here they are in high school. In fact, the guy on the left there is 13 years old. That's George Harrison when he was 13. Okay. And the Beatles became the most influential and wealthiest entertainers in the history of the world. Uh, but they didn't just spring forth incredibly talented. What they did, when they weren't much older than you all, when they were still teenagers, they went to Hamburg, Germany, because they were given an opportunity to play live there. And they pl went there five times in three years, from 1960 to 62. They went to Hamburg five times. When they, and there's a picture of them in Hamburg. When they were there, they played eight hours a night, seven days a week. Think about that. On stage, with an audience there, eight hours a night seven days a week. And you want to talk about diligent practice, getting up in a, on a stage in front of a bunch of people and singing a song, you are practicing diligently. You are working hard trying to get better. So that by 1964, when the Beatles came to America and started their run as the most influential and eventually wealthy entertainers in the history of the world, they had, pr they had had so much diligent practice, they had had 1,200 live performances. They had been there and done that. They had, they had practiced, 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 and that's what allowed them to become the Beatles. Let's try another one. Do you recognize this guy? This guy is Bill Gates. He is, depending on what day it is, the richest man or the second richest man in the world. He and Carlos Slim, a guy who owns the uh, Mexican telephone company, go back and forth. But again, we think of Bill Gates, we think of him looking like this. We don't think of him looking like this when he was your age, or like this when he was actually a couple years younger than you all. And so what did Bill Gates do? How did he, how did he end up founding Microsoft and becoming so unbelievably successful? Well, when he was in eighth grade, 
He went to a private school where, his, where the mother's club, they bought a computer terminal for the school and they used it until the money ran out. He just you loved this thing, liked being on the computer and practiced, practiced, practiced. And he did it until literally the money ran out. What I should tell you, since you all probably don't know what computer terminals are, because the phone in your pocket has more power in it than, has more computer power in it than all the computers in the world did in 1968. Um, that picture right there is a picture of Bill Gates watching some guy type into the terminal, and that terminal then goes, has a wire that goes off to a, a room somewhere, there was a giant room where a computer is in it, and then the computer makes the calculations and comes back. And so his, his mother's club bought this terminal that then was connected to a computer and they paid for computer time. Then the next year, um, a friend of his, um, they, they, for a friend of his, the high school club where he worked agreed to test software, and they didn't want money. Bill Gates didn't say, okay, well, we're, we'll do this for you, we want some money. Instead, he said, listen, what we want is we want to be able to use the computer when it's not being used by anybody else, because it was expensive to use computers back then. And so he worked out a deal where, through working on computers, he could get paid to work on computers even more. So that was when he was in ninth grade. By the time he was in 11th grade, he worked out a deal with a company called ISI, which is at the University of Washington. He was, grew up in Seattle, so right near there. And, and again, he worked out a deal where he worked on the company's payroll software. So again, practice, 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 working on the payroll software. And then again, didn't say he wanted any money for this. What he said he wanted was more computer time so he could practice even more. And then finally, the next year, a company called TRW, which is still around today, um, they did a deal with a power station in Washington, and they looked at ISI, and they said, wow, we like your software for your, for your uh, payroll. How would you guys do that? And they said, oh, well, it's actually a bunch of high school kids over here. You should, you, should hi you should hire them. And so TRW hired Bill Gates' high school club. And again, Bill Gates said, I'll tell you, I'll do it, but here's what I want. I want more computer time. And so he ended up essentially taking off his senior year so he could practice. And there are these stories of he and Paul Allen, his partner, who they would work all day, um, on this on this thing for TRW, and then at night they would walk to the um, University of Washington campus at two o'clock in the morning, where they could get on terminals and get more computer time because nobody else was using them, and they were just you know as close to 24 hours a day as they could possibly much master. They were they were working on the computers, so that by the time Bill Gates got to Harvard the next year, and quickly left to found Microsoft, it's estimated that he had more computer time, more computer practice than almost anyone else in the world. He had just practiced, practiced, practiced so much that he was almost destined to be successful. Okay, our final celebrity of the day is this gentleman right here. And of course, you probably know that that is Michael Jordan. You can tell even just from his silhouette there, there's Michael Jordan with all his rings. And again, we think of Michael Jordan, we think of him looking like this, not like this when he was a sophomore in high school, or like this when he was even younger. So again, there's a picture of Michael Jordan when he was a sophomore in high school, and one thing that I can tell you about that picture is that that's the junior varsity. How do I know that's a junior varsity? Because Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player, or at least many people believe, the greatest basketball player in the history of the game, he was cut from his varsity basketball team as a sophomore. So think about that for a minute. The best basketball player in the world couldn't make his varsity team as a sophomore. Now, did he go home and cry and say, oh, I want to be a basketball player, but I guess I'm no good. I have a fixed mindset, and I'll just never get any better? No. He started training daily. Okay? And again, we're talking about diligent practice here. He didn't just go out with his friends and shoot the ball around. No, he practiced diligently, and there are lots of stories of this, how he would go and he'd spend an hour on the same move. He would say, okay, I'm going to pretend, I'm going to fake to my left and drive to my right. Good. Fake to my left, drive to my right. Good. Fake to my left, drive to my right. Good. Do it over and over and over again for an hour. And that's boring. It's not fun. Do it for an hour. And then he'd pick another move and do it again for an hour. And then pick another move and do it for an hour. And he did this over and over and over again. So he then eventually made his, made his as a junior, he made his varsity team went to the University of North Carolina, where as a freshman he won the national championship, hitting what was arguably the most famous shot in the history of college basketball at that point. He hit the winning shot to win the championship as a freshman, then went to the NBA, where he was drafted third overall by the Bulls, and then won the Rookie of the Year title. So he was considered the best rookie, he had already won a national championship in college, so he was just going to rest on his laurels, right? Just say, okay, I've already made it, I've done it. No, this is Michael Jordan we're talking about. 
he looked at his game and said, I am not a very good jump shooter. I'm not as good as I need to be. That's why I need to practice. So after winning Rookie of the Year, he spent a couple hours a day practicing jump shots again, over and over and over again. Okay. To, uh, to facilitate his practicing, he built a full-size court in his basement. Now, again, it's nice to be Michael Jordan and be infinitely rich. That, but the point of this is not that he's infinitely rich and can do whatever he wants. The point is he didn't want to spend the time driving to the court every day. He was going so much and doing so much that he wanted to make it as easy as possible for himself so he could practice more. And so he built this basketball court in his basement. And finally, he started working out two hours a day before breakfast throughout the entire year. So before the Bulls practices, before he was supposed to be playing with the Pulps, he would still practice two hours extra on his own. And that's how he became the greatest basketball player in history. Now, some people may say he's not the greatest basketball player in history. Some say he would. But I'll tell you that he might not be, or he might be, but there's no doubt that he's the best famous person for growth mindset in the world. And he is just full of quotes, and you'll see some of them in a minute. So let's talk about failure for a minute, because anytime we try something, we may fail. Okay? And when we fail, we want to give up. And just because we have a growth mindset and diligent practice, they're necessary for success, success, but it doesn't mean that you're going to succeed every single time you try something. That's just not the way the world is. And so if you fail a math test, it doesn't mean that you'll never succeed and you should give up. It means keep trying, keep trying. And now, as I promised, here's Michael Jordan. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. This is a man who understands failure and understands success. Then finally, always leave him with the Michael Jordan quote. I can accept failure. Everyone fails at something. What I can accept is not trying. So now you can take out your guided notes. I'd like for you to, on the left, think of three things in which three th ways in which now that you understand growth mindset and diligent pra practice, three things you could do to improve your learning. And on the right hand side, I want you to list three things that you'd like to improve at. It doesn't have to be school. It doesn't have to be, oh, I want to be better at math or my history grade needs to come up. Uh, it could be you want to be a better soccer player. It could be you want a better relationship with your aunt. I don't care. Whatever it is. Three things you'd like to improve and ways that you think you can improve your learning.